All right, good morning. How's everyone doing? Good, good. I, I was looking around before worship and I was like, man, these people need to wake up. Like some of y'all forgot your coffee this morning or something. But man, something about being in the presence of Jesus changes everything. We're going to be in Mark 5 today. Mark chapter 5. We're continuing our journey through the book of Mark and uh, soaping through that together as a church family. I I'm loving it. Yesterday, I just got an email yesterday morning where somebody reached out and said, hey, pastor, I want you to know this might be the first time in my life that I heard God clearly say, I care about you. And uh, that's why we're doing this. That's why we're getting into the word, because I don't want those moments to just happen on Sunday mornings. I want those moments to happen Monday through Saturday as you guys are spending time with the Lord on your own. And I'm telling you, God will speak to you. The question is, are you listening? So you're turning to Mark 5. I've got a special announcement, all right? Can I, can I share a special announcement? I'm jazzed up about this, y'all. I'm fired up. All right, first off, we got to do a little recap, all right? Because I, I like to give God glory. Come on, somebody. And uh, so we started this church. Actually, a lot of y'all weren't even with us from the beginning, which that's just a miracle in and of itself. But we started this church with 19 people in the high school band room while we, uh, we made some people unhappy because we took out pews and we painted walls and, and we made this place look beautiful. That's what we did. And uh, we came into this house in September of 2022, officially launched the church. And I was curious. I wanted to see. So we started with 19. We've now ended 2023. We're in 2024. I wanted to see what God did last year. And so I looked at some numbers. All right. So in January of 2023, we had one service and our average Sunday attendance was 70 people. Come on, we can give Jesus some praise for that. Remember, we started with 19. And then I was like, all right, that was, that was January. But since then, we've launched two services. So like some of us, we don't even realize how many people were at the first service, what's going on there, that or the other. And so I was curious. So I pulled up December's numbers. In December of 2023, our average weekend attendance was 170 people. Come on, somebody. God's moving. And, and let me remind you, we are located in a town of 800 like, I know some of y'all are traveling here, but like, that's amazing. God's doing amazing things and I'm blown away. And I know it's not about the numbers, but it is because with every single one of those numbers is a soul. And my heartbeat is to see every single one of those people call upon the name of Jesus as Lord and Savior of their life. And so I think it's worth celebrating, but not only do we get to, to notice that and take notice of that, people in our region have kind of started wondering, what's going on at 7 a.m. church? Like, they, they, they're kind of weird. They're crazy people. Like, I don't get it. Their pastor looks like he's in high school. Like, what's going on with those people? And uh, so there's talk, like, you go to Buckland, you go to Meade, you go to Ashland, you go to Dodge, you go to Jetmore. Like, everyone's like, God's doing something. And what's been amazing about this is my pastor, he's in Garden City, Kansas, Pastor Jason Swan of Cornerstone Church. He's been calling me just fired up every single week. What's God's doing? How things are going? All that kind of stuff. And when Jason and I first met, he shared his vision with me when him and his family took the call to come to Southwest Kansas. And they said yes to the Lord. His, his heart's cry was to see spirit-filled, life-giving churches, not just in the big cities of our region, but in every small town community in this region. Because we know this to be true. Some of y'all are driving over here from Buckland, but Buckland also needs a spirit-filled, life-giving church. Some of y'all are driving over here from Mead. Mead needs a spirit-filled, life-giving church. We've got people driving from seven different communities who call this church home. And so Jason and I, we started talking. We started dreaming because that's who we are. That's what we do. And so we've decided, and I'm excited to announce for the very first time, that Cornerstone Church and Garden City has partnered with 7 I Am Church to plant a brand new spirit-filled life-giving church on January 12th, 2025 in Dodge City, Kansas. Come on, somebody. I, I am fired up. I know that there's like, I see question marks popping up over all y'all's head. I got all the questions too, all right? We don't know what, we, we, we don't know much. 
But we know God's moving. We know he said go, and so we're going to be faithful, and so we're going to partner together. We're going to plant a brand new church in Dodge City. And uh, yes, there are amazing churches already in Dodge City. Some of their pastors of those churches are my best friends, but I talked to them daily and they said, Michael, we've got, you know, a couple hundred people that call this church home, but there are thousands in our city who still need Jesus. And so that's who we're going after. That, that's our heart's cry. That's our mission. And so I'm excited that the next few weeks and months, we're going to unpack more of that uh, together as a church but I couldn't hold it in. I had to let you guys know because I'm fired up. I'm excited. God's doing a new thing and it's going to be good. All right. Mark chapter five. Let's pray. And then we'll jump into God's word. Father God, I thank you for this morning. God, I thank you for Cornerstone Church. God, I thank you for Pastor Jason and his heart to, uh, to partner with other churches in this region, to truly reach people, to be kingdom minded and to see all people experience the fullness of life in you and to make heaven more crowded. And so God, I pray that you would continue to uh, bless both of these houses as we come together to, uh, to plant a new seed and to plant a new house. And so Lord, we lift up Dodge City. God, we know that, that there are a lot of people there in that community and in that city who need you, Jesus. And so we pray that we would be the faithful ones to come in and to say, we love you, we care about you, and you've got a Father in heaven who loves you so much he died for you. And so, Lord, we pray that you are already preparing the steps and the processes that we need to see come together for that to come to life. Lord, we open your word today in expectation. God, we are believing that every single person in this room and online this morning would be transformed by the power of your word. And so, Lord, speak to us now, for your children are listening. Would you give every single person the message they need to hear today so they can leave this place different than when they came in? Father, we love you. We praise you. We thank you. It's in your precious and holy name. All of God's children said, amen, amen, amen and amen. Mark chapter 5, I'm starting off right away in verse 1. They went across the lake, and Jesus got out of the boat. A man with a demonic spirit came from the tombs to meet him. This man had lived in the tombs and no one could bind him anymore, not even with a chain, for he had been chained hand and foot. But he tore the chains apart, broke the irons on his feet. No one and nothing was strong enough to subdue him. Night and day among the tombs and in the hills, he would cry out and cut himself with stones. When he saw Jesus from a distance, he shouted and fell on his knees before him. With a loud cry, he said, what do you want with me? Jesus, son of the most high God, in God's name, don't torture me. For Jesus had said to him, come out of this man, you demonic spirit. Then Jesus asked him, what is your name? My name is Legion, he replied, for we are many. And he begged Jesus again and again not to send them out of the area. A large herd of pigs was feeding on the nearby hillside. The demons begged Jesus, send us among the pigs. Go allow us to go into them. He gave them permission and the demonic spirits came out and went into the pigs. The herd, about 2,000 in number, rushed down the steep bank into the lake and were drowned. Those tending to the pigs ran off and reported this in the town and countryside. And people from everywhere came to see what had happened. When they came to see Jesus, they saw the man who had been possessed by the legion of demons sitting there, dressed and in his right mind. And they were afraid. Those who had seen it told the people what happened to the demon-possessed man and told about the pigs as well. Then the people began to plead with Jesus to leave their region. As Jesus was getting into the boat, the man who had been demon-possessed begged to go with him. Jesus did not let him but said, go home to your friends and tell them how much the Lord has done for you and how he has had mercy on you. So the man went away and began to tell in the Decapolis how much Jesus had done for him and all the people were amazed. Man, thank you, Lord, for your word. Can we just be honest for a moment? This is a pretty wild story. Like, y'all didn't know we was going to be talking about demons today, did you? <laughs> Got him! I, I, I don't want to focus too much on that, all right? We're not going to get weird up in here. 
But I read this, and, and as I was praying and as I was dissecting this passage, there, there was really four distinct parts of this story that jumped out to me. And, and then as I prayed and as I began to process this even deeper, I, I began to realize that in all four parts of this story, I could see my own life reflected in all four parts. And so my heart today is that for those who are followers of Jesus in this room, that you would begin to see how you can actually relate to this man and what has happened in his life and what his response is to that happening. Now, I'm not saying you're demon possessed, all right? But hey, if the shoe fits, we got any demons in here? Just checking. Y'all know that's why we're going to Dodge City, right? Because I, I hate their mascot. <laughs> I, I'm not going to get on a tangent there. I, I'm going to lose my mind. <laughs> but when you drive, like, okay, the first time I came to camp, I'm going to get on the tangent. This is the second service, so I have until 2.20 to finish my sermon because that's when the game starts. When I first came to Kansas and uh, I saw that their, their mascot was a demon, I was like, Lord, don't let me come to this town. Don't bring me out here. It's scary, y'all. Demons. And we wonder why. We wonder why our youth are struggling with their identity. We wonder why our youth are struggling with their calling and their purpose and all these things that they're facing today. And yet a school will proudly proclaim and display a demonic face on the side of their school or on the side of their stadium. Y'all, that's my prayer. My prayer is that we would see that change, not because a board instituted the change, but because a miracle of God led to the change. We've got to understand right now in America, we have this problem that we don't take the supernatural seriously. And we think it's fun and we think it's a game and we think it's entertainment. But if this story doesn't say anything else, it tells me that the demonic realm is very real. But does that mean that I cower in fear? Absolutely not. Because if the demonic is real, then I'm telling you the power of Jesus is just as real and even more prevalent and powerful than any power a demon can have. And so as followers of Jesus, we can walk on this earth and we can walk in our communities and we can walk in our cities and our regions carrying the authority of the name of Jesus because every demon will tremble at his name. And we're about to see that. All right, let's dive in. I didn't mean to go on a tangent there, but y'all said let's go, so I went. All right, four parts, four parts. Part one of this man's story sounds like this. I was lost. I was lost. It doesn't take long. It, it does not take long for us to realize at the beginning of Mark 5 just how lost this man really was. First off, he's demon-possessed, all right? That's like the overall check the box. He, he's possessed by a demon, therefore he's not full of the Holy Spirit. He's lost. Second, we begin to see that he's isolated. He's living in these tombs, so he's alone. He's, he's by himself. And as we read even deeper, he's got probably some, some mental health things going on with these demons that he's battling. And so he's alone, and he's actually trying to hurt himself with these stones. The Bible says he, he cuts himself with stones. This man is broken. He's been rejected by society. He's been cast out from his community. He is lost. But it also doesn't take long for me personally to look back on my life and realize that there was a point in my journey where I could have identified with that same man, that I was lost. I was broken. I was hurting. Decisions I was making, whether they physically harmed me or not, were cutting me so deep that I never thought I could heal. And the reality for anyone in this room that would say you're a Jesus follower, there was a point in your life where you were lost. I, I would put it this way, no matter your testimony, we all have a story of life before Jesus. Church, we've got to realize this, that, that I know there's some in this room 
That, that you would say, well, pastor, I've been following Jesus for 60 years. Yes, but there was also a part of your life before you knew him. There's still a part of your story where you would say you were lost. And for others, it's easier for us to identify with the man and say, amen, I was lost. I, I know that I was broken. I know that I was addicted. I know that I was strung out. I know that I was rejected. I know that I was there. And then Jesus changed my life. Or if you're honest, there's others in the room today where you showed up to church and you might be there. You might be honestly saying, honestly, I'm lost right now. I don't understand what's happening in my life. I don't understand why people are leaving. I don't understand the situations that are going on. I don't understand where our country is headed. I, I, I'm looking for a hope. And that's why you're here today. Well, I'm here to tell you that we all have a testimony, but we all also have life before Jesus. I've actually had somebody in this church look at me before when I asked them, hey, share, share your testimony with me. And, and here's what they honestly said. And, and I love them, so I'm not calling them out by name. They were at first service. No, just kidding. <laughs> but here's what they said. They said, Pastor, I, I've been a Christian my whole life. Are you Jesus? <laughs> I, uh, explain that one to me. Wait, what do you mean you've been a Christian? Well, for, for as, as long as I can remember, I've been a Christian. Here's what I would say. You need to think a little harder. There's only one man who's ever walked the face of this earth. Who could truly and confidently say that the time they were born to the time that they died, their entire life, they were a Christian? His name is Jesus. Well, what do you mean, Pastor? I was born in that hospital, and my parents came to this church when it started, and, and I was probably in this church from the time I was a baby, and, and, and I'm still here. Okay, well, nowhere in my Bible does it say just because you're in a church building means you're a Christian. At some point in your life, you were lost. How do you know that to be true? Romans 3.23, for we all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. We all have sinned. So here's my challenge for you today. If you would say, well, as long as I can remember, I've been a Christian. Here's my challenge for you. Don't ever get so saved that you forgot you needed to be saved to begin with. Because when that, that's when you stop evangelizing. That's when you stop sharing Jesus with others. That's when you stop telling your testimony because you feel like you don't have much of a story at all. But I'm here to tell you the radical testimony is just as powerful as the faithful testimony. The faithful testimony of you were eight years old when you got saved. Well, guess what? You were lost before then. But just because you've been faithful since you were eight and you've served the Lord your entire life does not mean that your testimony is any less impactful than the 40-year-old man who's been a crack addict for 17 years that gets radically delivered and saved by the blood of Jesus. It just means they're different. And different people need different stories to be reached. And some of us need to remind ourselves that there was a point in our life where we also needed Jesus. And we know people in our life now that need Jesus. And our job is to go tell them about the man named Jesus. This man's story began with I was lost, but praise God. Somebody say amen. amen. Praise God that it doesn't end there. And if you're in this room today or you're online this morning and you would say that right now you feel lost, I'm telling you right now, your story does not end there. Here's the second piece of this man's story that we begin to see unfold. It sounds like this. I was lost and then I met Jesus. <laughs> I met Jesus. Mark chapter 5, we see 
Jesus crossing the lake and he steps out of the boat and the Bible says the man with the demonic spirit came to him. It actually says in verse six, when he saw Jesus from a distance, he ran and fell on his knees in front of him, crying out to Jesus. Can I tell you something? Culturally, Jesus would have been required to immediately distance himself from that man or else he would have also been called unclean. This man was demon-possessed. You don't, you don't mess with them. You let them be. That's why he was living in the tombs outside of the city all by himself. Because if anyone w was around him or with him, then that also made them unclean. But can I tell you what our Savior did? Hmm. He loved him right where he was. And church, that's why our job and our response is not to put a wall up between ourselves and the sinners around us. But that's why Jesus had a table and he said, come eat with me. That's why we're called to sit at tables with people. I, I want to say this. If, if your friend circle is just a bunch of church people, get some new friends. Because we're called to reach the lost. And I don't see Jesus walking down the street with a megaphone in New York City. Turn or burn, turn or burn. No, I saw him having intimate conversations inside of relationships with people. And that's what we're called to do, church. That, that's what this moment looked like for this man when he met Jesus. But I got to ask a question, all right? How did the man know it was Jesus? They didn't have Instagram or Facebook or YouTube or Twitter or X or TikTok or whatever the crap y'all use nowadays. I don't even know. How do you know? Not only does it say he recognized and identified Jesus, but also when he came to Jesus, listen to what he said. Listen to how he addressed him. What do you want with me, Jesus, son of the most high God? Not only does this man recognize Jesus, but he also recognizes the authority of which he has. How'd he know? Because all throughout the Gospels, we read of miracles that Jesus performs and people are still questioning, are you really the son of God? Who, who is this man that even the winds and waves obey him? And yet here we see a demoniac in a moment, come before the feet of Jesus, not just recognizing him, not just calling him by name, but also calling him by the authority he has. Son of the most high God. Here's why I believe this man knew. It wasn't the man who knew, it was the demons. And even the demons know the authority that our God has. Even the demonic knows the authority that our God has. Let me put it this way, even the devil knows that he's already lost. So my fear and my burden for the church today in America is not that we don't have chairs and pews filled. It's that we have people who would say they're Christians who don't know the authority of God, even though the devil does. And so we've sat down and we've been quiet and we've let the enemy tell us that our battle's over and that we've lost the war. Let me tell you something. The devil, no, he's already lost. So the only thing he can win at is convincing you that you've lost. But if you serve God and you proclaim the name of Jesus, there is nothing that can come against you that can overcome you. And even the demons knew. That this is Jesus, the son of the most high God. And they submitted to him because they knew that at the end of the day, whatever he spoke would come to pass. <laughs> Could you imagine, church, that sickness you're facing? Could you imagine if the lie from the enemy is that you've lost the battle? Because the enemy already knows that the blood of Jesus can heal it. 
that situation that you're facing. Could you imagine the devil knows that he's already lost and so he's going to convince you that it's over or that your marriage is too broken to be restored? Why? Because the devil knows the minute the name of Jesus gets proclaimed over that situation, everything can change. Do you know the authority and power of your God? Or are you going to let the devil take your place? Are you going to get to the altar? Are you going to get to the feet of Jesus and throw yourself down? Or are you going to let the devil take your place? We've got to begin to walk with authority, church. Because I'm telling you what you think you're facing right now, <laughs> it doesn't stand a chance against the name that is above every other name, the name that is Jehovah Nisi, the name that is Jehovah Jireh, the name that is Jehovah Rapha. I'm telling you, church, we've got to begin to see the authority that we have as his followers. I'm glad one person agrees with me this morning. But I'm telling you, what that also tells me is this. There's nobody that's too far gone for Jesus. There's nobody too broken. There's nobody too messed up. There's nobody too addicted. There's nobody too prideful. There's nobody too arrogant that can't be saved by the name of Jesus. All of culture and society had given up on this man except for one. Jesus. So if you're in this room today or you're online and you feel like everyone else has given up on you and you feel like you're never going to measure up, I'm telling you, maybe everyone else has given up on you, but today there's two that haven't, me and the Lord. And I want you to know that you're not too broken, that you're not too messed up, that you're not too sinful and you're not too far gone for the love of Jesus Christ. He wants to meet with you. Today, the second thing that I see in this moment of this interaction of the man meeting Jesus is this truth, church. And oh, it gets me excited. You never know what Jesus is going to do next. Like one of the most dangerous places to be is to think you have God figured out. Oh, well, if I just get to this and then God's going to do this, if I do this and God's going to do this, if I bring them to church and they're just, they're going to think we're weird, crazy people and they're just not going to come back again. Like we think we have God figured out. No, you don't. Whoo! I, I, you never know what Jesus is going to do next. Can I tell you something? I was an addict. I've been divorced. I, I've been homeless. I've lived in my car. I've been drunk at a bar passing out because I drank too much. I've been there. Can I tell you something? I never knew what Jesus was going to do next with my life. Now I'm in Mineola, Kansas, pastoring the best church on the planet, and we're getting ready to plant another church 30 miles north of here, y'all. You can't put God in a box. You don't know what he's going to do. Look at the scripture, y'all. Jesus sent the demons into pigs. What? I, that's awesome. Oh, they need to make a, a movie about this story, but they just want to make all the froofy movies. They don't want to address the truth and the demonic because that'll freak people out. He sent the demons into pigs. And then guess what the oinkers did? They drowned. They, they literally like jumped off the cliff, went in the water and died. Now, now I find this interesting. How many men were demon possessed? How many pigs did it take? Whew, that's interesting. Second thing is this. How much do you think those pigs were worth? Some of you farmers be giving me that side eye like, Whoa. like, could you imagine, Randy, could you imagine if you get a phone call this afternoon, hey, from your ranch hand, and he says, hey, hey, Randy, I, I got to tell you something, man, our, uh, our, our 2,000 head of cattle, they just jumped off the cliff into the poop ponds and died. How much you think that's going to cost? Can I tell you something? To Jesus, the cost didn't matter. Because he's willing to pay whatever it takes to save even one. <laughs> you can tell me, church, well, well, I think the church should spend this amount of money on this and this amount of money on this and this. To me, the, the cost doesn't matter. 
because I'm willing to do whatever it takes for the one. And sometimes it means doing things that make absolutely no sense. You never know what Jesus is going to do next. It's not just this story, though. Remember in Mark 2, when, when the friends bring the paralyzed man on the mat, and he's like, my feet, I can't walk, my feet. And Jesus is like, no, it ain't your feet, it's your sin. I want to forgive you, and then I'm going to give you the ability to walk. They didn't know that day that that man would not just be given the ability to walk, but he'd also be forgiven for his sins. You don't know what Jesus is going to do next. Could you imagine being Matthew, formerly known as Levi, the tax collector? He's sitting there and he's all crooked and greedy because he works for the government. And somebody said, amen. I can't say that. YouTube shut us down last week because I said something about the election. He's crooked. He's cheating people out of their money. And guess what happens? He meets Jesus and he's invited to be one of the 12 disciples. You never know what's going to happen with Jesus next. Think about the Apostle Paul for a minute. All right, I could preach a whole stinking series on his journey, but let me summarize it in three words. Terrorist to evangelist. You never know what Jesus is going to do next. You might think that person's too far gone. They might be the next person that leads a revival in this country. You might think your mother or father are too jacked up and broken because they didn't raise you in the way you wanted to be raised. You might need to be the one that introduces him to the man named Jesus. We don't need to put God in a box because we never know, church, what he's going to do next. Do you know our responsibility? It's not to figure it out. Yes and amen. Yes and amen. Man, I love the word. This man's story sounds like this. I was lost. I met Jesus, but praise God it didn't end there because then it says this. I've been changed. I've been changed. This man doesn't just meet Jesus and get delivered, church. He experiences a full transformation. The Bible says the pig farmers freak out. And so they run into the town and they tell everybody about what happened and, and everybody comes running. And, and it says that when they see Jesus, they see the man who had been demon possessed. All right, three things that stick out to me right here. Sitting there. We just read in the beginning of the passage of how this man was so crazy that chains could not even subdue him. And yet when they come back, guess how they find the man? He's sitting. Second thing, he's dressed. I'm going to give you an image for your imagination that you probably did not want. But he was probably naked when he met Jesus. Because he was so crazy and being tormented by these demons, he probably would have ripped off all of his clothes. And so not only now is he sitting there, but he's also dressed. And I love this last part. The Bible says he was in his right mind. Hmm. I was lost. I met Jesus. And now people see me in my right mind. Because I've been changed. You see, following Jesus is way more than just a one-time yes or a singular altar call moment. It's an invitation to a life of transformation. That's what it means to be a follower of Jesus. And yet, sadly, for many people who would say they're Christians today, especially in our society their testimony would have ended before this moment had the chance to occur. Here's what that story would have sounded like. I was lost. I met Jesus. And then I got my ticket into heaven. And I went on living my life however I wanted. Because a roadblock hits the Bible says without repentance, there can be no forgiveness, right? So where does forgiveness lead? Forgiveness leads to salvation, but surrender leads to change. 
So my question is this. Yes, you may have said that you've repented of your sin, but have you surrendered enough to let him change you? True repentance is not just I'm sorry for what I've done, but it's choosing to turn and go in the opposite direction. So I wonder if that's why so many people who would say they're Christians are, are ineffective today is because they, they may have said yes to Jesus in a moment and repented and, and, and said, now I'm saved, I'm going into heaven. But then they went back to living life how they did before and no change or transformation ever took place. You want to know one of the greatest ways that you can ask yourself if I've truly been changed by the name of Jesus? is ask the people around you if they've noticed any change. Because when the people come to Jesus, they saw the man who had been demon-possessed. Let me tell you something. He has not said a word, and people already recognized that he was different. If you were to walk into some of the places you used to hang out at, would people know you're changed? Or would they see the same thing? I think this is why in Romans 12, the Apostle Paul urges us. He says, therefore, I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, offer your bodies as living sacrifices, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true and proper worship. I believe he was reminding the church because they'd already forgotten so quickly that it's not just a moment of salvation, but there's a transformation that needs to take place. And we are called to daily submit and surrender our life to Jesus. That is our worship unto him. It's not just a song we sing on Sunday. It's the lifestyle that we live. And so so are we surrendering and submitting our entire life to God to be used by God and to be changed by him? Or are we holding on to things saying, oh, God, get me into heaven, but I want to hold on to this. This is why the Bible says if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. A new creation, like a totally brand new creation. It does not say if anyone is in Christ, they were given a new name or a new label. Why? Because you can change your label and nothing else change. But God says from the inside out, I want to transform your life. But church, that takes letting go. That takes surrendering. And that takes not just saying, Jesus, you are all mine, but saying, Jesus, I am all yours. This man experienced a change. He was lost. He met Jesus. He's been changed. And oh, the story is not over yet, church, because we're missing the great commission. I am sent. <laughs> I love this. I, I, I love this part of the story so much. This man experiences this transformation. And, and Jesus is, is, is with him. He's with Jesus. And the people come. The town. I find this so interesting in verse 17. The Bible says the people began to plead with Jesus to leave their region. You just saw a miracle. You just watched a man who was demon-possessed, who is now in his right mind. Why are you asking Jesus to leave? Because miracles freak out lukewarm people. Miracles freak out people who don't believe. And sometimes God is going to do things in your life that's going to freak people out. And just because they can't understand it or they can't comprehend it in their right mind, they're like, no, I don't want that. You can have that, but that's not for me. And so here's this man who's experienced this change. And this is how it's, the, the community he would be living with. 
This is how they're acting. They're like, no, we don't want Jesus. We don't want Jesus. And so Jesus is going to leave. And the man's like, I don't want those people. They're trying to kick Jesus out. I want to go with Jesus. And Jesus says, no. He was probably thinking, I, I don't want to have to argue with them. I they're trying to kick out the man who changed me. Like, I don't want to be with them. I want to go with Jesus. I want to go where it's going to be comfortable. I want to go where people are going to understand my story. I want to go where people are going to know who Jesus is. That's where I want to go. And yet Jesus says, no. What does he say? He says, go home to your friends and tell them how much the Lord has done and how he has had mercy on you. Go home to your friends. You see, church, being a follower of Jesus is not just about the salvation or the transformation, but it's also about the Great Commission and our job to go and make disciples. I'll put it this way, changed people are sent people. And if you've not yet truly been changed by Jesus, then it's going to be really hard to go tell others about him. But if you've experienced the blood of Jesus that has made you clean, that has set you free from addiction, that has delivered you from things of this world, then I'm telling you, you can't do anything but tell other people about him. Changed people are sent people. And I love that Jesus specifies in this moment, go home to your friends. Because sometimes, especially in our culture, in our society in America, we hear the Great Commission or we hear this word missions, and we think it's all about what's happening on the other side of the pond. And the Lord gave me this revelation when I was praying this week for us as a church. Sometimes your mission is not across the ocean, it's simply across the street. And I began to think, well, why, why, why is it so easy? Why do we like to be a part of international missions? Can I be honest? Because it's really easy to write a check for somebody else who's doing the work. It's really easy to go there for a week and to kiss on babies and take our selfies and then know that at the end of the week, we get to come home to our nice house and our Netflix. But when we're actually living as sent people, the ones that Jesus has called and equipped, and we realize that our mission is not across the ocean, it's simply across the street, guess what that's going to take, church? We're going to have to get dirty. You're going to have to put your hands in the dirt. You're going to have to open up. You're going to have to be honest. You're going to have to be vulnerable. You're going to actually have to talk to somebody. You're going to have to tell your story. Changed people are sent people. And I know one of the question marks that's going to come up now that we've launched and announced that we're going to plant a church in Dodge City is this. Why Dodge City? That's so close. Like, just tell Dodge City people to come to here. Well, I love how Holy Spirit moves because how long ago did I know I was going to be preaching on Mark chapter 5 this Sunday? About six months ago when God gave me the word for this year. And guess what the Bible says in Mark chapter 5? Go home to your friends and tell them about Jesus. The reason we're partnering with Cornerstone Church to plant a church in Dodge City is because we're going home to our friends and telling them about Jesus. There's actually a lot of people who would actually call this church their home church from Dodge City, and guess what we're going to do? We're going to send them to Dodge City to help plant that church. Why? Because changed people are sent people, and they need to go home to their friends and tell them about what God is doing in their life. I'm telling y'all, church, this is our mission. My goal and my heartbeat is not to create a fun, energetic atmosphere where we can come and gather on a Sunday and just say, this is it. No, my goal is to storm the gates of hell, every avenue possible, and doing whatever it takes to reach the lost and let them know that they are loved and that their life has value. And that's what we're going to do, church. 
I, I want to end by throwing the soap overview up. You guys can take a picture. I don't want to, I'm actually not even going to say anything about that. You guys can take a picture. I've already preached the message. But I want to close with this. Today is, uh, is Baptism Sunday. And believe it or not, this is the first time we actually don't have anyone signed up for baptisms. And so I was praying and I'm like, man, I, maybe we just cancel baptism Sunday. Like maybe we just, we don't fill it up. And God said, I meet your expectation. What's your expectation? And so I, I'm going to boldly ask today and, and we're going to pray. And there's actually going to be time. We've got shorts, we've got shirts, we've got towels. But maybe today was the day of your salvation and we're going to pray in a minute and you're going to repent and surrender your life to Jesus for the first time. Or maybe that's not your story and you've been a follower of Jesus for many years, but you've realized you've not yet been water baptized through immersion baptism. And when you hear those words of Jesus, go home and tell your friends, I'm telling you church, the greatest way you can do that is to go public with your faith and to get in that water. To not be concerned about what it might do to your makeup or if it'll mess up your hair or maybe you got lunch plans after this. I'm telling you, Jesus ain't concerned about any of it. So my question for you is this, what are you waiting for? Or maybe if you're honest, you would say, well, I, I probably went to an altar call when I was young, but I've realized that my life hasn't really changed. And, and people might think I'm a Christian because I've been in church my whole life, but I, I'm not truly changed. And, and today I don't just want to surrender those things to Jesus to be changed by him. I want to go in that water so I can truly be made new. And maybe that's your story. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to close us in prayer. And then we're just going to turn some music on. We're going to hang out. If you have kids downstairs, go get your kids and bring them back up. Don't leave because I'm telling you, I'm, I'm going to go nuts. If even one person says, Hey, I'm ready to go get baptized and I'm going to go get changed because I'm expecting that, but we're going to believe and we're going to celebrate and we're going to see God move in this house. All right. All right, let's pray. Father God, I thank you for your word. Hmm. The word that is alive and active that cuts like a double-edged sword. That separates bone and marrow. God, I thank you for the power of your word. The word that transforms and that takes a demoniac and turns him into a missionary. A word that takes an addict and turns him into a story and a testimony. The word that takes a broken marriage and restores it to a life-giving relationship that glorifies you. God, this is your word, and we honor your word in this house today. Lord, I thank you for this message. God, I thank you for the truth that you spoke today. And Lord, I pray right now for anyone in this room or online who has not yet repented and surrendered their life to you, God, but they truly would identify with a man that is lost. And they would say, I, I really don't know where my life is going. I don't have the assurance to know that if I take my last breath, I'll spend eternity in heaven. I, I, I'm lost today, and I'm here to tell you Jesus is here, and he's ready to meet with you. All you've got to do is come running to him, and I'm telling you, his response is going to be the same response that he had to that man, is to look you in the eyes and love you in the moment. So I'm going to ask you, that you this morning, that you would have a conversation with your heavenly father. The Bible says, if you believe in your heart and confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and he was raised on the third day, you shall be saved. But church, remember, salvation is just the starting line. And so it's not just a prayer of repentance, but of submission and surrender to declare that Jesus will be Lord of your life for all of your life and that all of you is all for him. So I'm going to ask you right now to have that conversation with your heavenly father. There's not a script. There's not a specific set of words. It's a posture of your heart to repent of your sin, to surrender your life, and to submit your will to his. Father, I pray for those in the room who, who would say they've met you, but they're not yet fully changed. Because there's still some things they need to surrender and let go. Lord, I pray that you would receive the surrendered heart in the room today. That you would take the weight off their shoulders to let them know they don't have to carry it anymore. That you would break the chain of addiction that's holding them back from walking in the fullness of life that you created them to do. 
and that you would provide in the areas where provision is needed because through a release of surrender, they're trusting you. God, I thank you. And Lord, I pray for a courage and a boldness to arise in the heart of every believer in this room. That that as they step out in faith, God, Lord, that you would remind them that they too needed to be saved at one moment in their life and there are people in their world who need to be saved. And so God, would you fan the flame of faith inside of their heart right now that they would get bold and courageous and be sent because they've truly been changed. We love you, Lord. We celebrate in advance an expectation for what you're going to continue to do in this house this morning. We praise you and thank you. We pray this all in your holy and precious name and all of God's people said.